Hello everybody, it is I, Captain Oblivious Mist, and I am here today to do the complete history of the RMS Celtic. Yep, we're doing a timeline of the Big Four, uh, but unlike most YouTubers where they merge the uh, Big Four into one big video, I'm instead going to do their own separate series that will come out alongside the Maritime Monday. Uh, so we can go more in, det in detail and more in depth into the Big Four. So they'll be their own separate series. Uh, but uh, yeah, without any further ado, let's get into the complete history of the RMS Celtic. Towards the end of the 1800s, the White Star Line had an idea to prioritise size and luxury over speed, leading to the construction of the Simric and the Oceanic. During their construction, a new ship was planned. She was to be smaller than the Oceanic in length, but bigger in tonnage. This would make, the make her the first ship to be longer than the Great Eastern in tonnage. And the name of this new ship was to be Celtic. And on March 22nd, 1899, her keel was laid at the Harland and Wolf Yard at Belfast Island. And on the 4th of April in 1901, the Celtic was launched and was then fitted out on July of the same year, and she left Liverpool on her maiden voyage. And this would also be the very last ship that the White Star Line chairman, Thomas Ismay, father of the infamous Bruce Ismay, would see go into service, as unfortunately he died later that year. While I can't find much on her interior, I have heard and seen some things and photos of her interior, so this is all I know and have heard of. She had a massive, well I wouldn't say mass, massive at the time dining room with a majestic glass roof and an amazing smoking room with stunning stained glass. As well as this, passengers also had access to things such as a library, a promenade deck and a veranda cafe. All in all, she'd she could carry up to 347 first class, 160 second class, and 2,353 class passengers. As well as this, her outwards appearance bears many similarities to my favourite ship and the first subject of my Maritime Monday series, Oceanic, with her two funnels and the design of her bridge. There's obviously a few differences in the position of funnels, and though the bridge looks similar, I ca and I can't put my finger on it, but her bridge does have, and her su forward superstructure does have a few differences compared to Oceanic. And as for her internal components though, she had two quadruple expansion steam engines that powered two propeller blades giving her a surface speed of around 16 knots, which would later come in use for the next part. The Celtic made her maiden crossing on the 26th of July in 1901 between Liverpool and New York, which was rather uneventful, but they did realise that due to the size of her, the ship, the loading time of her in each port was an outrageously long time of one week, so chances of the White Star Line being in the speed race are slim to none. But her career was still pretty solid, apart from a few incidents. The first one of which being a collision with a steamer called the Heathmore. She somehow survived with a hole in her hull. Another incident was when a fire started in her cargo hold. Thankfully, it wasn't anything too severe, well, unless you were the cotton in her hold, to which then it'd be a pretty bad time. And now we move on to a final one. As in Christmas of 1905, the Celtic was turned into Poseidon and she was hit with a wave, only difference being that the Celtic was fine apart from a door and a glass panel in the second class smoking room. Oh, and the obvious fact that uh, Poseidon sunk, Celtic was fine. Anyways, even though the Celtic seems to be accident prone, she still proved extremely popular and in 1907 she was chartered out to another company owned by the International Mercantile Marine Company. The American Line was the name of this company, and due to her success with the American Line, the White Star Line moved their operations to Southampton. Though these good times wouldn't last forever, as soon an Austrian Archduke was shot in Serbia, kickstarting the First World War. 
time of complete and utter chaos and even more accidents for the Celtic. At the very beginning of the war, she was converted into an armed merchant cruiser. Though, due to my favourite ship, the Oceanic, and her grounding in 1914, proving the uselessness of an armed merchant cruiser, in 1916 it was announced she would be pulled out of service as an armed merchant cruiser, and she would instead be turned, in, turned into a troop transport, and during this time a few mishaps happened, and one of these was when she struck a mine near the Isle of Man, and survived, but unfortunately 17 people died. And not long after that, she was assigned to carry oil. And on March of 1918, she was hit with a torpedo. Survived once again. Though three people died, and not too long after that, of March of the same year, the First World War came to an end. And in 1919, that's confusing, she was given back to the White Star Line who sent her to Harland and Wolf. Unfortunately though, this would begin her final nine years of life, as soon her accident proneness would catch up with her, as we'd see in the next section. After the war in 1920, she received a slight refit that brought down her third class passenger capacity to 1000 to help improve the quality of her accommodations. Now, as for the interesting stuff being her many accidents, the first one was uh, in 1925, when she accidentally ran the ship the Hampshire coast while sailing around the River Mersey. And then, after this one, there was another incident when she lost a propeller blade in Boston, causing her passengers to uh, take a train onto another ship. Oops. And then... She accidentally crashed into another ship called the Anaconda, near Fire Island. Though these incidents were minor compared to her next one. But before that happened, she received yet another refit in 1927, resulting in first class being renamed as cabin class. And her prices were dropped to make up for her speed as she was really slow. Though this would be useless due to what would happen the very next year. On the 1st of December 1928, the RMS Celtic departed New York for what would be her final voyage, which went perfectly fine with no incident until the 9th of December when a storm rolled in. In fact, this storm was so bad that the Celtic decided to miss, uh, please forgive me for this pronunciation, Cobe, as the sea was so rough it was near impossible to meet her pilot vessel. Speaking of which, it didn't take long for the Celtic's pilot to realise the Celtic was missing off that port of call. So they went home, call blame them, leaving the Celtic all alone and she continued forward through the weather until the seas and the weather had calmed down, causing the captain to decide to turn back and try and make the stop. This would prove fatal, as while she was waiting for another pilot, the weather decided to ramp up again. This time, it seems some unseen force didn't want the Celtic to escape, as this proved fatal due to the wind and the waves being particularly strong, in fact so strong she was knocked onto a bunch of rocks. Ouch. After this, the crew assessed the damage and after this was done, it was decided that the ship was in no immediate danger and thus the next morning breakfast was served at 6am. And not too long after that, a rescue effort was carried out by a bunch of lifeboats, tugs, and apparently some destroyers, though I don't think that's 100% accurate, because why the hell would a destroyer help a civilian liner not in wartime? But uh, apart from that, you may now be asking, why didn't they pull her off the rocks and return to service? Well, that, my dear viewer, is because the insurance company that assessed her quite rightly said she wasn't worth it. And if they did pull her off the rock, she'd probably sink. So it was decided that she was going to be abandoned and scrapped, which was completed by 1933, bringing her long and amazing career to an end. Now, 
my ending thoughts of the Celtic after doing the video on her is she had an amazing career. It was very long and very eventful, and apparently there must have been some unseen force looking out for her due to the amount of collisions she'd had. It's kind of coincidental how, despite the collision she had, she'd survived this long, especially to say she was the first ship of a class of four, which I do plan to do the other uh, four in a future video, more on that in a minute. Her career was long and nice, she was a beautiful ship, and in my opinion she has cemented herself into my ten favourite ships, and if I ever do a remake of that list she would be in it. And it's a shame that she is never really spoken about in history books, despite being Ismay's final ship. Hello everyone, me again. Uh, surprisingly, this video did not take long. And I would also just like to say a big thank you to the person who suggested this video. Um... Well, because they actually suggested a video on the Big Four, but in case you didn't watch the end of my Aquitaine video, uh, which I believe they did, uh, at the end of the Aquitaine video I said I'm going to be doing a whole series on the Big Four, which I do intend to do. Um, but yeah, surprisingly this video did not take me long, and quite frankly it was one of my favourite videos I've made so far. Also, apologies if uh, certain photos seem out of place, there's not that many photos of the Celtic that I could find, and more apologies if I sounded like uh, I was a bit ill towards the end of the recording of the video. Uh, my nose blocked up midway through, don't know why and I don't know how. But yeah, uh, apart from that, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>